Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with designer Paul Munko. A graphic designer with his own company, Colorful Filth, Paul has been designing logos, concept art, marketing materials, and products for all manner of company for years. But only in the last year or so has he stepped into the realm of knife design. His Comet, a stylish sub three inch bolster lock EDC by Kaiser, burst onto the scene and was lovingly embraced by the knife community. Uh, he's got a new Kaiser knife design in the offing that very, excites me a lot. Uh, it covers a lot of different bases as well. We're going to talk all about that and find out how this graphic designer became a knife designer and an up-and-comer right here. But first, uh, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show uh, to your favorite podcast app so you can listen to it whilst on the go. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to get there is go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon, if you will. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Paul Monko, welcome to the show, sir. How's it going, man? Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's great to have you. Um, we were talking right before we started rolling um, about, well, you're a graphic designer, and this, this is uh, this is the uh, approach uh, that brought you to the knife world, and it's very interesting. Actually, my, my sister, I have a lot of very close people in my life who are graphic designers, incidentally or coincidentally, and um, it's cool to see someone break from the two-dimensional into the three-dimensional, like, real design, uh, product design world. Uh, before we get there, uh, tell me a little bit about your art and uh, how you how you became an artist. Have you always been an artist? And uh, tell me about your approach. Yeah, definitely. So um, ever since I was young, you know, I was never like the athletic guy, for sure. You know, I was never good at any sports or anything like that. Um, I was always really into music, so like playing music, instruments, uh, and drawing. Um, those two things I never thought would necessarily be something I could make a uh, career out of, um, but I kind of just, I guess, through through a little bit of luck and a little bit of uh, hard work, have been able to turn that into what I do uh, most of the time, uh, along with the marketing and along with all of those things as well. Um, and yeah, just art has always just been definitely a passion for me. Um, I figured out how I could do it in kind of a more commercial sense instead of just drawing pictures kind of for fun. Uh, and then it just kind of spiraled into working on a bunch of cool projects, um, doing things like skateboard graphics and, and sticker designs and logo designs and things like that. Yeah, that's uh, for all of the artist types I know. And I guess I include myself in that, though I've had a steady job for a number of years now. But uh, a lot of people who make their lives creatively uh, cobble it together with a lot of different jobs, working for different people. And uh, and then frequently having your own company as well. And I think that uh, that kind of experience working for a bunch of different people and working for yourself uh, gives you a really broad knowledge of kind of how to proceed with uh, with the business side or the career side that you really want to get into. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate where I work currently, which is like I was telling you earlier, is uh, the office that I'm in right now. Um, we're, we're like a full service marketing agency and, um, you know, we do a lot of digital marketing, website design, things like that. Um, but I'm, I'm very good friends with the owner of the company. And so we get to work on a lot of projects kind of in tandem where uh, I could take on clients of, of where I work um, if they need like branding or if they need logo development or, or any kind of like brand strategy. So it's a very kind of like symbiotic sort of thing um, that really allows me to work on any of the, the fun design projects that, that I enjoy. Um, while, of course, still maintaining my, my career where I work. Um, with, the, uh, with the actual design and the actual art, um, you have to do things for clients and you have to do what they want and get their message across. And then you get to do your own expressive stuff. You have a company of your own colorful filth. And I was, I was going through your website, really, really cool stuff. I mean, you have everything from uh, murals that, or I'm not sure if that's the right term, decals that go on to uh, pro scooters and skateboards to uh, really gorgeous, just straight up artwork. Um, Thank I, you. 
Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so how do you, uh, what, what kind of niche does colorful filth fill uh, both for you creatively and out there in the market? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's definitely interesting, right? Um, so I was always into that very kind of visual um, sort of like skateboard-esque kind of graphics, like the things that you would see maybe on some stuff from like 80s, 90s skate decks. Um, and then just kind of incorporating that in something that's like very vibrant. Um, I've always thought that kind of the juxtaposition of things that are realistically like dark thematically, but done in some very vibrant and kind of out there colors just kind of create uh, something interesting, you know? And it's definitely, uh, it's a relatively narrow market, but it's a market that I enjoy. And it's the kind of thing where I'm doing these projects as kind of, um, you know, uh, in my free time, um, it's something that I enjoy, and it's something that I'm very fortunate that there are other people that also enjoy it as well. Uh, that that juxtaposition of um, of dark dark content, dark uh, meaning, uh, with colorful illustration um, is interesting. I, I've always liked that contrast too. I mean, you you see stuff like that pop up in movies and art. And uh, when I was uh, in college, I listened to the Smiths a lot, an old mm -hmm. band from England. And it was the same thing, very dark when you listen to the words, but uh, sort of presented in a jubilant way. And uh, it's kind of a sneaky way to get people to uh, confront things they might not want to think about. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's, it's honestly just a lot of fun. I think, um, I think that being able to just take, uh, you know, like I love horror, obviously you could tell by like the, the stuff that I do. Um, I love horror movies. I love horror video games. Um, and just turning that into something graphical that isn't just necessarily like, you know, a photo of a, of a dark room or something that's something that's like traditionally scary. Um, doing it in sort of a more illustrative way has just always been something that I've, I've found fun. Uh, you've you've done a couple of specialized scales for uh, the banter, the wee banter, uh, mm -hmm. the the uh, um, and the Benchmade bug out. I saw a really cool uh, exclusive uh, design that you did, not just on the handle but on the entire blade. And it struck it strikes me speaking to you now and and hearing about that uh, sort of light dark influence that that uh, that aesthetic or that approach is really good for knives and the knife world because uh people you know it's like the knife world 10 years ago emerged out of this long period of black and gray knives silver blades black g10 handles and suddenly there's blue and then there was red and then and then just you know everything opened up and oftentimes you'll see skulls or that kind of motif on a knife but to ha but to mix it with those colors that everyone's uh, kind of jonesing for i think is a is a great approach Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely part of part of my thinking with it, um, because I definitely when I'm doing stuff, especially in the in the knife realm, one of the things that I'm very conscious of is, is I don't like giving the perception of knives as like these murdery weapons kind of things, because some companies like to market things that way. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, a lot of people who aren't really into the community perceive them that way. So when it comes to the stuff that I actually put on the scales, I still try to retain some of that. Um, weirdness that kind of like off color sort of artwork but not make it too like you know aggressive or like yeah. military um or something like that uh like if you look uh let me see if i can pull this out so this was one that we did uh with northern knives um they're, they're the company that i collaborate mm. with all the time um to to do these like art-based collaborations so uh this was one that we did on the spidey chef um so this is like anodized uh laser engraved and then i think they do some clever masking stuff to make sure that some of the raw titanium is still retained uh, I don't know how much it's going to focus on that, but oh, he's, he's, it, he has like a little, uh, it's like a little cut up fish platter. He has a little knife down there. But if you turn it around, you can see that he's, uh, he's become the, the meal, so to speak, because we got the wow. little, little chunk taken out of his helmet and the thing kind of flowing. And like, it's still, it's still dark. It's still weird. Right. Um, but it's not like overtly aggressive, I guess, is kind of my approach with that kind of thing. Yeah, and it's it's actually pretty to look at, and you know, and then you see what it is. It's like, oh, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And I also like that sort of old timey flash style art. I don't know if flash is the right word, but it reminds me of kind of uh, stuff you'd see, um, you know, Ill illustrative stuff you'd see in the early part of the twentieth century. I, that really appeals appeals to me. Um, Thank you. So, yeah. how did this? Uh, how did your um, well, have, well, let me start with this. Were you always a knife guy leading up to this? So I always thought they were cool. Um, you know, my dad was always working in the yard with them. And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a cool knife you're using for whatever. And I had little ones like growing up. But um, I'd say that my kind of 
obsession, I guess, with the industry. Um, definitely started uh, maybe four or five years ago. Um, and it was really random, honestly. We were So we were going on a trip. Uh, me and my roommates at the time were going on a trip to pick up a dog in like another state. It's like a 14 hour drive. And, you know, of course, on that trip, you, you make your way into all the different kind of gas stations that present themselves to you in, in the Midwest as we're getting over to like Ohio. And, um, you know, I, I see these giant displays of these these crazy, you know, not good, but crazy looking knives. And I'm like, oh, it's, it, this is interesting, right? Like there's there's even though these are like not the best, which I didn't know at the time there's thought behind this and there's like, there's, there's cool like artistic elements to what people are doing with these. So since I was the passenger and I wasn't driving, I literally just spent like 10 hours just researching like knives, essentially. Um, like what are the good companies? I started learning about like Benchmade and Spider Co and stuff. And I started just kind of seeing what makes things good, what makes things bad and you know, why I shouldn't buy one of these cool ones from the gas station. Um, and then from that, you know, I just, I just started buying them. You know, I, I the first knife that I bought was the Spider Co Tenacious. Um, and I was just like, wow, like this is actually, you could tell that even though this is obviously their least expensive model, um, it's, it's quality, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting industry. And then just did more research, got into like all the different subreddits for, for knife collecting, um, kind of saw the, the crazier side of things that people are posting things like, uh, Elijah Isham designs and things like mm -hmm. that. And I just, uh, yeah, I just really gravitated towards, um, functional art. I think that was what was the most interesting aspect to me is the fact that this is something that you could have every day. Um, it's useful. It's a useful tool, but you could really kind of go sort of outside the box and make it visually appealing as well. Uh, I think it's beautiful that it was gas station knives that that reeled you in. And and I, I know you're not the first first person, but you're coming at it from a professional artist perspective and you see all these gas station knives and we've uh, maybe we've all, uh, hopefully we've all seen the displays in the rest stops. Um, <laughs> and, and I was, I just incidentally just took a road trip and was hoping to see those and did not, uh, though I didn't go to my usual gas stations on this particular <laughs> route. Uh, but I think it's beautiful that you were reeled in by that because it's, you know, it, in a sense, uh, it's cheap and tawdry, but it's also, it, like you said, it shows thought and it, it also shows that there is a large there's a large enough uh, customer base out there to justify manufacturing them in the first place. So there's something there. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, so uh, I think in, in most of those cases, those knives are, um, those knives are uh, assisted open. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, well, I want to get to the Comet, which is not assisted open, which the Comet uh, is a very, very refined design, both uh, to look at and in hand. And, um, Obviously, uh, the, whatever inspired you from those gas station knives, uh, you, you sort of pared it down to the very essence with this design. Um, tell me about how you sort of uh, took the actual shift to designing a knife now. Um, I'm not just doing the scales, not just doing the art, not doing stuff on the periphery, but I'm making the knife or designing the knife itself. Uh, tell me how you arrived at that and what your design goals were with it. Definitely. So one of the things um, that, that I think was really cool is that throughout kind of like creating artwork and things, um, I did end up doing a lot of work for Eugene from uh, Olenic Cutlery. Um, and, and him and I talk frequently and, and he's kind of the first person who told me like, hey, you should sketch up some knife designs, like see what you come up with. Uh, and I did. And I did it for months and months and like I wasn't really happy with anything. Um, but then eventually I kind of got to a point where I was like I had very rough approximation of like what I wanted to do as far as like um, kind of the knife silhouette in general. It definitely wasn't the Comet yet, um, but I felt like I was getting to a point where I had created something that I was like happy with. Um, so uh, my the reason that I ended up working out with Kaiser, which actually really worked in my favor, uh, the first collaboration that I did with Northern Knives um, was on the Kaiser Uprising. So that's this guy right here. Um, it has like my name on the pocket clip or whatever. Um, this was kind of the first thing that we we did. And so kind of being that this was the first, I guess, art on a knife related project, it just, it felt like, you know, I should reach out to Kaiser. I should tell them, hey, I, I did this project like two years ago. I'm thinking about designing a knife and, you know, here are my ideas and stuff. Um, and then just kind of organically from there, it, it just happened. And I got to work with their team, um, kind of show them my, my designs and, and uh, just kind of bring in the idea of the comet to, to be what it is today. So what were uh, your goals in the design? Um, uh, like what, what, what kind of knife did you want to make? 
Definitely. So I wanted to make something that was a gentleman's knife for the first one. So something that's relatively small, something I could bring into this office and nobody's going to be freaked out by it. Um, but I also wanted it to have something that is different, especially since we were kind of catering more towards the the more budget friendly side, which I, calling a $90 knife budget friendly, I guess, is different than it was a couple of years ago. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we wanted to kind of cater to that. And I wanted to make sure that I could do something to make it, um, you know, value like you're getting value from it you have a titanium clip you have cool materials um and i wanted it to be something that was um not just your average budget knife you know as far as like you know you can kind of see like your run-of-the-mill um things that are released like 10 a month or something i wanted i wanted it to be some sort of style to it so um a lot of the design cues here are, are kind of uh art deco inspired a lot of the kind of the lines and the curvatures here um with that whole sort of art movement so uh, you know, with kind of the expanding silhouette over here um, and, and kind of the, the way the clip kind of ties into everything as well. Uh, so I just wanted to make something that was affordable, uh, something that had interesting materials and uh, just just kind of stood out in that sort of like budget place, especially since it was my first design. I just wanted to make sure it was something that was unique to kind of my preferences, essentially. OK, uh, don't put it away. <laughs> Hold it Got up. It. Um, so uh, a cool thing about this is you get to come out with your first knife and it and and you get to i don't mean get to i mean you uh thoughtfully create a knife that looks high end it looks like a high end knife it's a bolster lock which which um a i love the way it looks but b i love the way a bolster lock functions especially um well always i love it better than just a regular frame lock because I'm not worried about fat fingering the the lock and not being able to open the blade. Uh, so I think that was a great uh, choice, but it also looks good. Um, uh, but uh, see, I lost my train of thought here. What, what was I getting at with this um, with this design? Oh, what, what I was getting at is uh, it looks very luxurious. It looks high end, uh, but it's a $90 knife. I was shocked to find that out. Uh, it comes in a number of different color ways. Uh, with different anodizations, which makes it look, uh, you know, more expensive and different color titaniums, or I mean, uh, micartas. Um, I think that was a smart thing because you could come out of the gate with with that knife all super high end and charge 300 bucks for it. And people people would be, you know, who's Paul Munko and why should I love this knife besides the fact that I love the way it looks? Mm -hmm. So uh, smart decision there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we were we wanted to make sure that we can keep it as interesting as possible. So like this one, um, there's two variations. This one has the black uh, linen micarta with the copper bolster and the, and the pivot collar. Um, there is the green uh, linen micarta with with the brass, um, which is definitely definitely a cool one. Um, and then the one that's kind of a kind of a curveball is this one is actually made um, with a sort of uh, antiqued brass finish. I think they do some mm. kind of coating on it and then like tumble it. Uh, and then this is actually denim. So um, Kaiser has something where they do their, their whole like denim series of knives with different denim scales and whatnot. Um, and yeah, we just kind of ended up throwing this into the mix. Originally, it was only supposed to be these two, um, but we we kind of, they thought this would be a cool idea. They ran it by me. I was like, hell yeah, more, more variations, the better. And uh, <laughs> honestly, it ended up being my favorite one. I, th I think that this one's super cool. Which one has been the most popular? Uh, so probably the denim. Uh, and the reason I would say the denim is because with the denim one, I, th I think it's like $4 more, <laughs> but <laughs> you get this knife roll, like, like oh, every single denim one comes with this, <laughs> with this denim knife roll. So it holds, uh, you know, like three, I guess, potentially six, if you have like small ones, uh, and, and like a pen or two. Uh, and it's, and it's a really good value add. And it's just something that Kaiser I know does frequently with, uh, well, pretty much all the time with their, with their denim series knives. And, you know, when you, when you think about spending four bucks more and having something that actually provides more utility, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that has really resonated with a lot of people, too. Uh, I, I love the look of the green micarta with the brass. It reminds me of sort of World War II kit, you know, with the with the mm -hmm. olive drab canvas and the and the brass uh, fittings. That's uh, that's my pick. But I got to say, adding that blue to the mix takes takes the knife into uh oh well obviously it just makes it um you know the black and the black and then the green they they do have a tool and sort of almost militaristic uh feel but then you add the blue to the line and it it sort of i think that was a good move it 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 softens it a little bit and uh well makes it more appealing to more people 
Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it, it really works out. And one of the other things that I was conscious of too when I was kind of coming up with all of them is, um, you know, I think that it definitely, especially like you said with these two, it kind of lends itself to this sort of, uh, this sort of like this almost rustic aesthetic, right? Like it's a, it's a very, not very traditional, but it's a tr traditional inspired kind of blade shape. Having this bolster makes it sort of traditional. So right. having these traditional materials with micarta and brass and copper, um, it gives it a certain look. But at the same time, you know, if in the future we were to do something where this was like a, uh, more like the clairvoyant with like carbon fiber scales and, and uh, you know, a titanium sort of bolster. Um, you know, I think it would almost give it a completely different aesthetic while maintaining the same, literally everything else the same as far as the silhouette, the lines. Right. Uh, so it can, can, I think it can be a little bit of a chameleon uh, depending on the materials that we actually use for it. Yeah. Yeah. You could basically change the mood of it uh, just in one in one stroke. Um, the, the blade shape you mentioned, uh, so it's a long clip point. I mean, that's what I call it. I don't know. I don't know exactly what, how you would define it. Yeah. Uh, to, to me, it's got that long clip and, uh, that's very appealing to me. Uh, tell me about when you were designing the blade, the kind of, uh, uses you were thinking of for it. Definitely. So being that it was, uh, you know, meant to really be something that you can carry in an office, carry, uh, you know, anywhere that not intimidate people. Um, I wanted to make sure that it was good for just your day to day, you know, open, cutting threads, opening boxes, opening food packages, um, you know, very basic food prep, like cutting an apple. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that actually I was really conscious of is sharpening it. Um, so I use a like a guided sharpening system. I use the KME um, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I, I just wanted to give a really nice area for purchase for that little clamp mm -hmm. on the system here. Um, <clears throat> so so that was definitely a big consideration there because. I know that maintaining um, a knife is also something that's very important. And if you have a knife that's a pain in the ass to sharpen or a pain to uh, disassemble and you know, re-lubricate and stuff, uh, you're, at least me, I'm less likely to carry it. I'm less likely to use it because I know once it's kind of run its course, I have to do a lot to it. So um, I wanted to make sharpening easy as possible. If you, if you know where to, you're putting your clamp, you're going to know every time just based on kind of where the grind is. Um, and then also the whole knife can be disassembled by just – removing this screw and then the pivot screw. So oh. clip screw doesn't matter. This screw doesn't matter. Um, you could, in two seconds, you could take both those screws out, clean out everything. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to maintain, uh, which was a big consideration. Now I misspoke before. Uh, a, I said it was a bolster lock. It's a liner lock. I'm not sure why I was thinking bolster lock. I think just because there's a bolster on it, but uh, yeah, no it worries. is a, it is a liner lock, which makes it, you know, even smoother. Uh, there's been a big move back. I don't want to say back. There's been a big move towards uh, titanium um, titanium right. liner locks, like full titanium knives, but with liner locks instead of frame locks. Be just I, I think it's because of the premium that's put on action. And uh, if you're not interrupting the action with finger pressure on the on the lock, it's going to feel, you know, ever more luxurious. And let's let's be honest, that's what that action is about. It's the luxurious feel. Uh, yep. Tell me about the prototyping process and, and uh, because, you know, this, I played with this knife at a uh, blade show, very, very smooth. And um, so action has a lot to do with the appeal of this knife. And that's something you can't see through pictures. Uh, so tell me about the prototyping process and what it was like to receive your knife back for the first time and the kind of tweaks you may have sent back to them and, and that process. Yeah, uh, it, it was such a surreal experience getting, getting the first one. I mean, even the second one, seeing that prototype come in. Does anything that becomes three-dimensional, like a, an object I could see physically, is just the coolest thing. Um, so we only really went through one stage of kind of like prototyping as far as the R&D is concerned. They sent me one of them. There was a few things I wanted to change. Uh, mostly um, in the prototype, they actually had this screw that's in the scale in, uh, in the bolster. Um, I don't think I have it with me, unfortunately, but th that was really the, the only main difference. Um, there was that, and then I just wanted this grind to be a little bit more steep so that when you put it on the KME, you don't kind of get that like smile thing right away. Um, but yeah, I mean, beyond that, it, it was a very, it was a very simple process really, because um, when I'm designing knives, you know, I'm, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I, I don't know necessarily how to make this function at, properly, like with the, give it a good action, right? I don't know like lock geometry like that. When I design something, it's very much visually. So uh, how do I want it to look from this side, from this side, from the top, you know, open, close, whatever. What, what lines do I want to line up? 
So I mock all of that up in sort of like vector and then their team during their R and D during their prototyping stages, you know, they, they know all that stuff, of course. So mm -hmm. they're able to basically make a 3d version of that. Let me know what in my design will work, what won't work. Um, and, uh, this one had a lot of, um, uh, I had a lot of help with as far as like functionality, the clairvoyant, um, the second one, I, I think I learned a lot through this project. So I, I knew a little bit more about, um, what would fit where and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it was a big learning experience. They definitely helped guide me in the right direction to make sure that like the action was solid. Um, and even with the first prototype, the action was, was phenomenal, especially considering the price point. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a really, it was a really great experience for sure. Uh, do you think you're going to expand the line uh, with a mini or a plus size? Um, I'm just curious. I love, yeah. uh, I love the design. I think it would make a great plus size design. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing, too. There's two things that I really want to do with the con three things, actually. Um, I want to take kind of where it is in its current state and, and do sort of an upgraded materials version, um, something kind of similar to, to where the clairvoyant is right now. I think that would be cool. Um, I would like to do a front flipper version um, because I think that if we were to kind of just, you know, do a nice little nice little roll there and then clip this off, I think that that would be really nice. And I think that the open silhouette, um, you know, minus that that flipper tab could also be very clean. Uh, and then also, yeah, a bigger version, I think would be great um, because de people definitely have asked for the, the two biggest complaints that I've heard uh, is uh, it's too small. And then I actually ha heard a lot of people don't like the clip, um, which I'm totally cool with. I like it, but I totally understand where, uh, why people wouldn't. What what don't people like about the clip? So some people think it's it's too large um, for the size of the knife, uh, which which I understand. It definitely could be shorter. Um, the reason I, I did it this way is it, again just from like a design standpoint. I just wanted this. Uh, where is it? I just wanted this part. You know, the, the tip of the clip basically to line up with this this curvature right here. Uh -huh. So that's kind of why it's that long. Um, and also, uh, you know, some people think that since this is uh, my card on brass or copper. Um, that the titanium clip is just a little bit out of place. So, I, and I, I could see that too. Um, I, I like it still, but I, I understand both for sure. I, I, I would not, well, I haven't held it, so I can't, uh, I can't speak. I haven't commented or used it. I should say, I, sh I haven't used the knife. Um, so I can't comment on the length of the clip, uh, but I would disagree with the, uh, the, the titanium assessment. Um, a, you could always, if if you need it to look like the bolster, you could anodize it or have it anodized. Um, but uh, B, it, the I, I'm I'm pocket clips to me, they kind of exist in an abstract space. Yes, they're they're on the knife and they need to uh, be harmonious with the design. But when you see them, they're in your pocket. M most like most usually they're hanging out of your pocket. Yeah. So, so they, they kind of exist in two different worlds. And, and uh, um, to me, ultimately it's like, if it does, if it doesn't bother my hand, I kind of don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally get that too. And, and that's kind of one of the main reasons I wanted to go with the titanium. Um, you know, wire clips are great. Um, you know, traditional kind of like bent steel clips are, are great mm -hmm. from a function standpoint. Um, I just I don't think they look the best. And also, I just think that having like a flat surface like this is just a much less uh, much less of a hot spot than like a, a bent, you know, your traditionally like, cheaper sort of right. bent flat kind of thing. Right. OK, so uh, let's talk about your new design, the clairvoyant. We covered it on um, uh, this show on the midweek supplemental a couple of weeks back. And uh, it's a very exciting project to me. It looks different. It looks uh, you know, uh, it's not a sophomore jinx where, you know, sometimes people's second knife looks exactly like their first knife and, um, it, you don't get that at all here. You have a different size, different form factor. Tell, tell us about the clairvoyant. Yeah. So this one, um, this is, I think where I got a little bit more comfortable with, with the process, right? Like I, I had a better idea of what can be done. Um, and so I just kind of like, like, if you look at the size difference, it's pretty ridiculous. But, um, so I wanted to do something instead, instead yeah. of kind of like a, a slim down kind of pokey sort of blade, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more, more of this like S curve, um, can be used as like a real realistically, like a food prep kind of knife. Um, and I just wanted to go a little bit more interesting, I guess, like with the line works, like I, I wanted to see where I could take it as far as, um, the curvatures here and the different sort of beveling that's going on. And, and, and definitely with the clip, it, it's got, you know, some interesting sort of sort of sort of just, you know, machine work done there. Um, yeah, I wanted to make something that was still true to like 
what I like, of course. So like my, I love things that have uh, a bolster. I love things that have a pivot collar. I just, I just think that those two things together look awesome. Um, and, and I wanted to make sure it was still like, you could tell that I, I thought of it, but I wanted to go a little bit more out there with the clairvoyant essentially. Right. Hey, uh, Paul, can you mute that, uh, that bell? Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Uh, um, oh, that's my computer. <laughs> oh, oh. So, uh, I, I also, uh, okay. So bigger form factor, totally different style knife. And, and it's interesting that you say, um, you're thinking more kind of along the lines of food prep right now, because yes, that makes sense to me. Of course, I see everything, um, through my weapon lens and I, I, I like, I like the way that sits in the handle. It's got, it's a, it's a slashier kind of a, a affair than the pokey affair, uh, yes. of the comet. So looking at it through that, it also looks like it fits the hand beautifully, but, but you're actually discussing the practical use of it. And yeah, it looks like it, it would be a great blade to use great blade and handle setup to use against a flat surface, uh, doing that kind of cutting. Definitely. Definitely. And, and yeah, I think that from, from that kind of standpoint too, like it definitely does, does kind of fit that role. It is definitely a bit more aggressive looking. Um, there, there's a couple of changes that we actually are making in, in the final production version. So like these, these screws are going to be, um, T8 as opposed to T6. Uh, we're adding some jimping here so that you have a, you know, nice. kind of better grip. Um, and then just, just to make it fit a little bit better in the hand, because, uh, you know, there's definitely people out there with, with larger hands than me. Um, we're going to make this uh, sort of choil just, just a little bit, just a little bit bigger, but oh, like the overall curvature, like as far as where it actually seats in your hand when you're holding it, um, mm -hmm. it definitely, it definitely, it's definitely comfortable, which, which I'm super happy about. So, uh, very different, uh, ergonomics, uh, than the Comet. The Comet is like very neutral. And this is uh, less so. This kind of puts your, uh, uh, it's got, it kind of guides your hand, uh, your fingers into position. Um, any, any thoughts on, or I, was that a, a purposeful change? Yeah. So I think that kind of just what comes with the territory of having something that's a little bit strange like this, like having this sort of bent sort of angle here. And then, uh, you know, the curvature down here. Like I feel like just to, to make it, go to the right place essentially in your hand like it's a good idea to just kind of at least put some sort of guidance um there's gonna be a little bit more clearance here too so that you're actually able to choke up on it uh oh, if you yes. wanted to um in the in the production version but um i think that just the weirder something gets the more you kind of have to think about like where your hand is supposed to be because you know if you, if you introduce something that's a little too abstract um with no guidance you know it just it just might not always like fit into the hand perfectly every time you grab it I've been thinking about this in terms of how handles uh, accommodate curved blades, whether they're upswept or like hawk bills. And uh, because in my, I've been gravitating uh, towards uh, kind of out of, now this doesn't mean I, I, any love is lost, but kind of out of the Emerson uh, sort of ergonomics or, or uh, some of those cold steel uh, handles that, that have all the choils and kind of uh, into a more um, neutral handle style, uh, just in my personal, you know, liking in the kind of knives I draw and doodle. Uh, but I always wonder, like, do, doesn't the handle have to somehow accommodate that curve uh, with its own curve, which would have to be kind of opposing the curve of the blade, A, and B, um, to, to, to just look harmonious in design? I don't know if, if any of that means anything to you, but... No, no, but definitely, definitely. Um, it, it definitely makes sense because if you look at, um, you know, obviously if, if this was just like straight across this way, um, this, this blade wouldn't, wouldn't fit. You'd be cutting your hand every time, every time you close it. Um, so there definitely is sort of like that balance, I think, where, um, you know, you could either kind of have two options, right? So if you want your, your blade to be like taller, right, and you want to have give it that sort of extra space, you could either curve the back or, you know, you could, you could just make it so that it, I guess it technically would would close a little bit less and make the blade taller like this way, like sticking out of it. But then it, then it becomes really thick in your pocket. So I, I prefer the sort of like curved, curved idea for that. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it looks really comfortable. You know, sometimes you can just look at a knife and know that it's going to melt into your hand. That kind of has that. Um, uh, so in this one, you're using different materials. It's a little higher end uh, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, what you're getting out of what, what uh, materials are you looking at? So uh, the original plan, I was hoping we would be able to use fat carbon, but 
I believe on this first batch, um, we're going to be doing kind of like what, what this is. Just it's like a shredded carbon fiber. Mm, nice. Uh, and then we have the titanium uh, backspacer, bolster, and pocket clip. Um, but I'm like 99% sure that we're also going to be doing um, at at the same time a, a more budget focused version that's going to be more similar to the material set in the comet, which. Uh, I'm actually really excited for it because I think it's going to be the same kind of thing where, uh, you know, just, just changing those materials up, I think will give this a very different aesthetic, you know, having this be like brass or something in, in the micarta. Yeah, it'll give it a different aesthetic and it'll also really broaden your customer base um, yep. because that might be a knife that is that someone is 100 percent about and they get the titanium version. Or it m might be a knife that someone's 85 percent about. and They're like, you know what, I'll get the. Uh, I have 10 other knives I need to get this year or uh, this month or whatever. <laughs> <you're talking laughs> um, so uh, let me, let me get this brass one. And if I love it, I'll, I'll, I'll trade up for the, to the high end materials. I think it's cool that uh, uh, companies like Kaiser, I, I think uh, are open to, this is what I've, I've gleaned from talking to a bunch of people are somewhat open to you coming to the table with ideas for materials. Uh, but ultimately I guess, if you're under their label, they have to decide what's best for, for them. Is that how it works? Yeah. So there's definitely, uh, it's, it's definitely like a conversational kind of collaboration. So, uh, you know, I'll give them uh, my ideas. Like, so, you know, this, these two were, were my idea as far as the copper and the black micarta and the brass and the green micarta. Um, and then they throw this idea at me. Um, and it's, it has a lot to do with like material availability, you know, ultimately, because if, if it's something that where they're just licensing the design for me, a lot, there will be, um, instances where they're going to want to use kind of what they have on hand if they don't really know what the demand is going to be for something and making that investment into you know a huge order of fat carbon or something like that. Um, but yeah, it, it's a very it's a very like collaborative approach where I, I basically tell them what I think would be best and, and if they can do it, then we do it. And if not, they'll kind of give me the option or a couple different options to sort of pick from. Uh, do you, as a designer, do you get tempted by what you know are trends like? The super steels, uh, for instance, uh, is there a temptation to want everything to be in M three ninety? Um, not entirely, honestly. I mean, like so much is out there in 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 that material. Like, I'm I'm more in, in for me at least as somebody who's looking at it from more of a visual aspect. I'm kind of more concerned with what makes it look different. So, like for for me, you know, personally, when I'm designing something in my head, if I could do a trade off and, and keep the price low, because I don't want to be making something that's like four hundred dollars, because that's just not my target demo. I think for most of the stuff that I'm doing, maybe in the future, but for right now, I think that like I kind of want to stay in this sort of area, like sub two hundred. Um, you know, if if I could put a little bit more into making it look really unique, you know, as far as like having some sort of really cool like. Uh, snakeskin fat carbon or something mm -hmm. um, and you know maybe take a step back from like the best deal on the market right now um, for me that's a fair trade-off because I'm definitely like a, a, a visual person um, but I do know that there's people out there who would who would rather just have like a slab of g10 and and uh, some like crazy steel on there as well so it's it's, it's kind of, it kind of depends who you are <laughs> yeah yeah and I think I think th uh, those of us who actually use m390 to its to its uh, maximum are vanishingly few. Uh, at, I think, I think like most of us, we just like to know that for whatever amount of money we're spending, we are technically getting the best. Whether yeah. or not that actually means anything, it doesn't matter. Um, I am not so much like that. I, I know that I've gone through severe periods of that, but I feel like I've come out on the other end, uh, kind of remembering uh, why I started loving knives in the first place. And it wasn't for the material uh, choices, you know, so so yeah. if I it's it for me, I'm also very visual and 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 it is the visual ultimately uh, that that will draw me to something. And then from there, it's like, oh, I love having this in my pocket and I love it when I need to use it and that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, for me, they are little pieces of of usable art. Uh, the, the button lock. This was a cool thing to see um, when I first uh, cracked open that knife news story and saw this i was like "Ooh, this looks like a button lock and then i did a little reading and indeed it is uh tell me about your choice to go with a button lock and um you know what you like about it definitely so um i have uh let me see i know i have like a couple of, of button locks in here i think the coolest one i have is definitely this one uh the slim pickings from uh Ooh, alliance yeah. designs um and i i just i love 
how it functions. Like I, I always thought it was really cool. And then one thing that I noticed about this is you kind of have the same benefits that you get from designing something around the concept of a liner lock because you can make the the scales symmetrical, right? Like whenever you're going to have a, even a bolster lock or if you're going to have uh, especially a frame lock, there, there's a big trade off there as far as like, you know, you can't really make the, the, the clip side look like the show side because there's this huge sort of moving piece that needs to be a certain way. Um, so for this one, you know, knowing that I wanted to do something different than a liner lock, it seemed like based on the shape of the bolts bolster that uh, a button lock would make the most sense because I could I could retain that sort of symmetry on both sides. So did, did uh, going from that uh, going from designing a liner lock to a button lock, did that uh, um, uh, present any particular design challenges to you or was that more for the engineers to work out? So I do a very rough approximation when I'm doing kind of my design works. Like I, I design everything transparent first so that I can actually see where the lines are intersecting, like where the blade is mm. touching with the, with the, the actual button itself. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll look up basically like a template of like how a button lock works and then kind of build off of that, um, that concept. Um, it was a little bit more challenging for me just to figure out like how much clearance I would need re realistically for, for this to come in contact with the button which I'm looking at and not the camera. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, so where it kind of connects right here, making sure that the handle is, is slim and, and not like have this huge hump on it. So, so there was like some challenges, but honestly, I feel like this was a little bit easier than the liner lock because you don't really need to figure out like that, that access point as much because, you know, I've, I've, I've definitely held a lot of, liner locks or frame locks where just there's not enough space to really like get your finger in there and disengage the lock. Yeah. Uh, where with this is just, you know, as long as the button's there, it's, it's going to disengage just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that access to the lock bar has, has become a big um, uh, talking point in a lot of people's reviews. I think thanks to Jared Neve, he, he always brought that up and now I bring it up and I noticed a lot of people bring it up. It is a thing, you know, it, you have to unlock the knife. And since we are, since we are in the realm of luxury, why do you have to struggle to close the damn knife? You know, it's yeah. not it's not out of, uh, you know, making it more stout for the job or anything like that. So you may as well have that be a consideration. That's funny that you mentioned that because that is one thing that I a thing that I did notice about the Comet. It's very easy to unlock. And, um, you know, I don't have particularly large fingers, but those guys, you know, with sausage fingers trying to get into a little tiny frame lock is it's like give them give them a chance it's tough yeah it, it could be very difficult and and so i just the ease ease of use and just kind of like every regard was definitely um for honestly for both models um was just kind of the most most important thing um for me at least when, when thinking of kind of like the locking mechanisms you failed to mention the fidget factor of a button lock i mean oh yeah and, and then this is a large blade what is that 3.6 or 3.75 yeah, it's like three point six, and it's definitely yeah, it's a it's a fidget animal for sure. I I do this all the time. It drives it drives my girlfriend absolutely crazy. But yeah, <laughs> that's what it's, it's for, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you have a large blade like that, it's always it's always better. Like with an axis lock or a button lock, if you're oh, if yeah. you're into the fidget, it's that you get yeah, that weight. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Is great. that uh, is that going to be hollow ground? So the the prototype is. Mm -hmm. Um, but w they did notice when kind of doing some testing on their end that there were some stability issues with kind of where, where the grind cuts off and having it be this hollow. So, um, we did have to kind of go with a more flat ground approach for the actual production version, just from like a durability standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to keep it hollow ground, but I'm, I'm kind of just taking their word on it because they did say like, you know, we had the tip break on a couple of them already just from, you know, just from just testing things. So, uh, you know, I'd rather as much as I like a, a cool hollow grind, like, uh, where is it? Uh, like like this guy right here, like the the hologram. Oh yeah, fantastic. Um, as much as I love that, I I again I want it to be usable. I don't want people to have this huge beefy kind of again more aggressive kind of style knife. And then it's like oh I got to be so careful because it's it's too. Yeah yeah exactly. It's like the yo the yo jimbo slash yo jumbo. Uh, I love those knives and I love the hollow grind. They come to such a fine point. That if they weren't sort of uh, first function for cutting flesh, I'd say this tip <laughs> is way too like dainty. And I've dropped plenty. Well, I've dropped my Yojimbo, a couple of them. Tip, and they always land tip first, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, your, uh, um, 
well, first of all, I'm now I'm distracted by that that Brian Brown you pulled out. Uh, oh, it's great! It's so good. <laughs> yeah, what are what are some of the other knives that that lend inspiration? That is a beautiful. One. Oh man, yeah, this thing is this. He did such a great job with this, and and Rhea did a great job with it too. Um, inspiration. So definitely uh, anything Alamic, I love um, because they're just super out there. The way that I'm out there, so like I have um, this busker that they made for me. Wow. Um, with which the kind of, kind of the running joke is it looks like a pickle, but it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it does. it's a sick busker. Um, they actually made the serial number. I don't know if you could read it, but it, it's colorful filth on the on the, oh, on the backspacer. So cool. um, you can see too here. You know they, they do the whole kind of S curve thing to, to mm -hmm. fit the blade and have that nice you know kind of lower cutting edge. Um, this one's super cool. Also from them, I have uh, the this two four seven, which is sweet. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Super aggressive <laughs> looking kind of thing, which which I, I do love. I do love it. But um, yeah, a, a lot of their stuff. Um, trying to see what else. I have I have so many things in here. Um. This one's pretty cool. This one definitely, uh, I think that I, I definitely drew some inspiration as far as kind of the clip design on the clairvoyant from this one. This is the uh, Shaburkov mm -hmm. Scout, I want to say. I'm pretty sure it's the Scout. Um, I don't know why I'm like blanking on it. But yeah, they kind of have that cool sort of like beveled clip action, which, um, yeah. you know, gave, gave me a little bit of a little bit of inspiration as far as the beveling on something like that. So, I mean, definitely different, but all cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love the beveling on the clairvoyant clip. That looks really nice, and that, that's also I, I, that has a function too. You know, if any of us, any of us who drive cars, know that you're you're every once in a while, you're rubbing up against the car or, or rubbing up against something with that pocket clip, and to have the have those angles there not only looks good, but it it can go easy on the world around you if you're if you're a klutz. Yeah, um, no. So I want to I want to kind of bring it back around. Um, Branding strategy and marketing, that's something that you specialize in as a, um, you know, in your everyday career, mm -hmm. um, your non-knife career. How has that uh, awareness and that mastery um, translated into your knife efforts? So I think that <laughs> I think that has really helped me kind of establish a, a specific demographic, like a specific type of person with specific interests just so that I could make sure that I'm catering to um, not, I don't want to say one group, but just catering to a group that I could really do everything I can to please. Um, Cause it's, it's, it's hard to please everybody. Um, so kind of knowing i um, doing a lot of market research just on my end uh, as far as just being a part of the community, you know, watching a ton of different views from a ton of different channels um, being in, really involved with like the Reddit communities and things like that. Um, it's just given me a lot a lot of knowledge as far as uh, you know, how do I how do I find the people that are going to resonate with my ideas the most? Like how do and how do I make those people as happy as they could possibly be? Uh, how would you define your key demographic? Good question. So I think that um, they're they're definitely similar to me in the same vein as you know it's it's more of the uh, as much as I love the whole I, I mean I, I love weapons, <laughs> but um, I think that as as like carrying. A knife and carrying something being that i'm usually in an office environment i think that a lot of people who are kind of into you know maybe the rustic flair who are into kind of like the carrying a tool kind of thing um and just carrying something that's useful but also kind of has those um sort of elegant design cues in it um that that's kind of that's, that's how i am typically with the things that i have on me on a day-to-day -day basis and i think that that um with that with the way that i edit my photos with the way that i kind of present the imagery that i that i take of them i think it kind of falls into that particular um, you know, almost, almost, I don't want to say jewelry, but like, I think of it almost way like you would take photos of like a watch or something. Yes. Like you kind yes. of build this lifestyle around it of like, oh, like you know, maybe you're camping with it and you're using it as a tool and like, you know, uh, getting, getting your, your firewood ready or something, you know, um, just, just kind of that, that image and that aesthetic is kind of what I've tried to build around, um, what I'm doing so far. Yeah. Or maybe you're, you're sipping whiskey in your dark den, you yeah. know, uh, reading yeah. a book and it's sitting there on top of your cool leather wallet next to your watch. Yeah, that's, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, the it, it really does fit into that whole, you know, the whole knife collecting. Um, a lot of us are pen uh, watch lovers, leather lovers, you know, just lovers of these different kind of uh, mechanisms and, and little uh, machiny type things. And and yeah. that's where that's to me what a gentleman's knife is. Uh, so definitely, like I look at the comet, yes, and that fits that role. And it, 
you know, I've, I've been trying to define gentleman's knife recently, and I used to think it was just light and slender and small, but th that is not the case. And I discovered after I got the Finch Knives Buffalo Tooth, it's their modernized version of the, hmm. of the, of the, um, of the that. elephant's toenail, you know, the big, broad. So anyway, it, it's a it's a big knife and it's broad and but it is all gentleman's knife. So I'm, I've been reconsidering, uh, you know, it's an it's a it's low hanging fruit to say light and slender and you can wear it in slacks. Yeah, uh, it's more of a spirit. I think so. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Like it's, you know, certain materials or, or certain design cues that kind of lend itself to something that would be, uh, you know, like like the beveling of a watch log or something like that. Like it's just. Um, yeah, it, it's building this this sort of uh, specific aesthetic that doesn't necessarily, you're right, need to be tied to size or, or functionality. It's more of just what is it? You know, what, how does it look? How does it fit into the lifestyle of somebody who, where this would make sense? So uh, then where do you see uh, Monko design going um, in terms of your product design? Do you see yourself uh, dipping your toes into these other uh, interesting um Areas like watches or pens or, or whatever your other material fetishes are? Definitely those two are them. <laughs> um, uh, cool. And um, I mean, I would love to, you know, I, I think that really, you know, I have ideas for everything. I think a big part of it would just be finding the people, right? Like I, I really, I really got lucky um, with just because of just how legitimately interested I got in, in the knife industry very fast. You know, I mean, I was a collector for a, a few years before I even started working in the community as an artist. Um, and, you know, I really started to enjoy it. <laughs> I really started to like everything about it. And so, you know, it's, it's a lot to do with who, you know, you know, any collaboration is going to be about who, you know, what connections do you have? Who can I talk to and, and present my ideas to? Um, if given the opportunity, I would love to do something pen related or watch, watch related would be crazy too. Cause that's, that's super intricate and, and interesting to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, there's no plans for those things just because I don't know who to approach for it. But if right. it was presented to me, I would I would jump on any of that in a heartbeat. And in terms of knife makers out there, now this is just uh, this is just hypothetical. But who are who would you like to collaborate with? Oh, I see right there, you collaborated with Brian Brown. But in yep. terms of uh, on a knife itself, if if the opportunity arose, oh, you made the CMF logo too. Awesome. Uh, if the if the opportunity ever arose to collaborate with another knife maker to make a knife, what would that be? So there's two. Or who? Um, okay. It would definitely be Ian for sure. I love mm -hmm. his designs. Um, and then also Ian Pekarski of CMF. Yeah, yeah. Um, he his stuff is really cool. Uh, I, I love everything that he does. Uh, it's definitely a dream goal of mine. Someday I'll definitely buy a knife from him. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of his custom pieces but yeah no his, his he has a very very unique design language that i really like and then on top of that definitely uh some sort of collaboration beyond just artwork and, and creating a knife with uh olamic i think would be really cool because i think as far as like um i guess they're they're, they're kind of all over the place as far as like their mid tech their custom um but just in that general realm i think that what they do as far as all these like kind of extra things like the, the holes and this like stone just milling and crazy dremeling and stuff um, they go as out there as like my head goes when I start thinking about certain things. So I feel like we'd be able to do something really cool together. <laughs> yeah. Those knives, those Olamic knives have each one seems to have its own signature. Like each one, you know, is so handled, you know, by an artisan. I'm not sure exactly how it works there, but, um, yeah, I've been wanting to talk to Ethan, right? Uh, uh, no, it's Eugene. Eugene, I'm sorry. I've been wanting to talk to him for years. Uh, but each one seems like an individual uh, work of art. And, and I, I would imagine that, that that resonates a lot with you. So in terms of knives now, just the future of Monko knives, um, what kind of body of work do you want to have uh, you know, in, in the future when you're looking back? Um, I just want to have a bunch of stuff that I'm really happy to kind of have in my pocket, honestly. Um, so I have... You know, I have these two technically because the clairvoyance can be out soon. Um, I do have two more projects that are kind of in the R&D stages right now. Um, and I'm just, I, I noticed that I kind of gravitate towards like different features, right? And, and really, ideally in my head, I want to create a knife that kind of fits the mold of, of each thing, right? Like I want to create a worn cliff. Uh, I want to create a front flipper. I want to create, um, you know, maybe even an automatic someday or something. Like I want to have something for everything. I think really. So like, what, what would this type of knife look like if, if it comes out of my imagination? I just want to hit all those different points. 
Okay, so Paul, let let everyone know how they can keep up with your work and uh, the best way to uh, to find out about developments. Absolutely. So um, you can definitely follow. I have a, I have a ton of Instagrams. But the important ones right now would be uh, for my artwork. You could follow me at Colorful Filth. Um, for any of the knife specific stuff, you could follow me at Mungo Knives. Um, and then also, I do have a <coughs> excuse me. I have a newsletter uh, that you could you could join and subscribe to. So if you go to colorfulfilth.com. Um, click on the newsletter tab, uh, you know, you can put in your email address and I'm definitely not spammy with it. I don't think I've sent one out in like three months, but whenever there's a release or whenever there's something cool and exciting kind of happening, if it's whether it be a Northern Knives project or, you know, a new, new product dropped on my end, as far as like Monko Knives, um, you know, I'll, I'll send out an email blast, some, you know, do some giveaways and stuff on there as well. Um, yeah, th those three places I would say are the best place to kind of, kind of stay in the know. Great. Well, some really exciting stuff coming from you, Paul Monko. Uh, graphic designer uh, turned knife designer. Well, you didn't turn. You just added that to your <laughs> yeah, to your yeah. panoply. Um, and, and also just really, really great fine art as well. So, Paul, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Munko, um, who just goes to show never underestimate the power of gas station knives to inspire because without gas station knives, we would not have Paul Munko on this show. So it was great to meet him. And I really look forward to checking out the clairvoyant. Uh, I hope you are looking forward to checking out next Sunday for another great interview. Uh, and then, of course, there's Wednesday, the midweek supplemental and Thursday. Uh, Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.